start. So let's start. Um, welcome to the R4DS book club, uh, cohort 10. Um, just before Gabby takes us through chapter three, uh, just a quick note that we've been discussing already that um, we, we're doing pretty good on signups. We have people signed up into December, so that's great to see. Um, it sounds like probably uh, actually into January. So um, if you, you know, again, I highly recommend claiming chapters, particularly things you don't know. Don't be afraid that you don't know it because if you're presenting it, you're gonna learn it. So if it's something you really want to learn, uh, claim those chapters. Um, and then the other thing is in two weeks, uh, it's the week in between when like Europe uh, stops doing daylight savings and the US stops doing daylight savings and calendars are a mess across all of our 4 ds So we just pause all book clubs that week. So on November 3rd, there won't be a meeting. Uh, take that time to catch up. Um, you know, we do have a pretty hefty chapter next week and important chapter next week. So maybe take some time to really absorb it. Uh, and that is it. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Gabby, take it away for workflow basics. All right, let's see. Okay, let me share. So um, hello everyone, I'm Gabby and I'm gonna be talking to you today about workflow basics, right? This is, this is a very um, basic chapter. But I think like John said a, a few minutes ago, it lends itself to um, to a lot of discussion, right? So I'm going to be talking through some of these points that are going to be very basic, but maybe someone has um, something interesting to share about that or how they do certain things, especially when we get to, um, like, for example, commenting or talk about functions or stuff like that. And most of you are more, or some of you, I'm not really sure, are um, experienced coders. So maybe you have very important tips and tricks that you can share that not necessarily I know, right? So please, if you have anything to add, just um, start talking or write it in the chat section or something like that. And I'd be more than happy to to hear and learn from your, um, from your experience and from your um, very vast coding experience. Um, so let's let's start. Um, so let's begin with the learning objectives. So essentially, we're going to review some very basic R coding, the very, very basic things that we can do in R. Then we're going to talk a little bit about style conventions when writing code, explain the importance of commenting your code, and how exactly are we commenting or not commenting our code. Um, recognizing good practices when naming objects, which is which is a huge thing because to this day, I don't know why people do this FOO fool thing with naming things. I don't understand that. I what the hell is going on over there? So maybe someone can share some light with that, and uh, maybe we can. Yeah, I think that one's very good for naming objects because my. Anyway, I'll, I'll, we'll get to that part. And then at the end, talk a little bit about functions in R2. And um, yeah, so let's, let's begin. Um, I don't know if I need to make uh, the slides the letter a little um, larger. I hope that this is okay for everyone. But if you need uh, me to zoom in or something, just please let me know. Or do I seem to have lost my chat? Let me just put it here. Okay. So, um. To start, we know that R is essentially, at the most basic level, a calculator, right? So we can do basic math calculations, like division. Um, if you want to do like a function, like a very basic function, like the sine or something like that, then that is exactly what, what uh, you can do in R. So some of the code that is in the book, I put it here. Like, for example, if you want to do a division and then a multiplication, and it follows, if I understand this correctly, um, the order of operations, right? The um, I re uh, PMDAs, I think it's called in English, because in Spanish we have a different um, sort of acronym for that. Um, and then you can 
obviously use parentheses and then some functions that are already um, defined like um, like pi, well, that's a, that's a number, right? But uh, constant, but SIN for sine and COS for cos, cosine, I think it's called in English. Anyway, so very basic things at the very basic level, we have that. And then we, if we move forward with what we can do in R, we can start naming objects. So we can start um, saving things or saving objects in the environment. And we do that by using the assignment operator, which is essentially the minus sign. I think it's called in English. And then the, min the minus, um, well, the lesser than and the minus sign. In, Eng uh, in, um, in Windows, the, um, the shortcut is alt minus, but I think in Mac is option minus, right? And that's I'm very big on using um, shortcuts, like with your keyboard, because who has the time to go to your, to the mouse? I, I, I hate it. So then I'm going to talk a little bit about shortcuts too. And when we um, when we say this, when we verbalize the code or the thing that we're trying to do in R, I've heard it. The book says "gets," like that's how the book defines how you say the assignment operator. So, for example. If we're doing x assignment operator three by four, then you would say x gets three times four. But I've also heard people use assign because it's called the assignment operator, right? So I've also heard it like that, even though that's not in the book. Um, let me see the chat. I think I think the oh, the okay, nice okay. thing about gets is that you can just drop it in. Um, you don't have to put words around the rest of the expressions. So, whereas if you just use a sign, it's x assign three times four, you know, that doesn't come out as nice. So that's the only, I think that's the only reason that that came to be a thing. And you'll hear people say that in other contexts um, because of it. Um. Uh, one question <laughs> regarding... English or American type. Yeah. A question regarding the assignment um, and the use of the equal sign mm -hmm. is I think that's a, a discussion and there are different camps and who prefer what. Um, if, for example, in my case, I do code in, in other languages. So for me, sometimes it's uh, more natural to just use equal sign. But uh, so is that something that you should say is preferred in any way or, or, or the other? I used to really resist using the arrow. Um, I thought it was kind of silly. It only exists because R or S, which R comes from, uh, was invented where the keyboards had a key that put an arrow in. And so it used to be a literal arrow. Um, but I actually really like that you can tell the difference between assignment and something used as an argument. So if you say X gets whatever, if you're searching for X arrow, that comes that gets different hits than X equals if you use them to mean different things. Okay. Um, so I actually, it started out, I resisted it, but I, uh, I like it <laughs> for that, specifically for that reason. And then it does, because of that, it um, can make your code a little bit more readable because assignment looks different. And so it like just helps things stand out, I think. Now I've been writing in, in R for or pretty much exclusively in R for a while now. So uh, I think my opinions have changed because of that. <laughs> okay, uh, seems fair. Yeah. Thanks for, for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it... To me, like when I see the equal sign, it, it not anymore, but it used to irk me a lot. And I'm like, no, you say a sign, but you know, it's fine as long as it's understood or something. Um, and also, like I think people that are um, they started using R many, many, many years ago. They started with the equal and then moved eventually to the sign. So they are at least. That's what I've seen in my field. 
um, then they move to the to the assign. But anyway, the the really yeah. old school one, the the trivia piece is oh. that in the old days, way before I ever used R, I think it was only an S that uh, underscore was the assignment operator, and so you couldn't use underscore. That's why a lot of older things have periods in their names instead of underscores because you couldn't use underscores in the names of things in R wait like version one or maybe even before version one um but yeah version I, point five. <laughs> yeah and I guess the other reason that I like the arrow is for things that we're about to see <laughs> okay so then the other thing that I've seen but I don't know if you've seen this John too or if this, this is just something that I've seen for some of my professors but I have seen people use reverse assign. So let me explain this a little bit, or maybe someone has seen it too. So sometimes when you start, for example, doing a, a plot, like with what, what we saw with ggplot, we usually don't start naming that object. We start directly with the code, like the ggplot, and then we have the geons, and then the scale, and blah, 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 blah. And then once, we, because we, we are constantly running that to see how the graph looks, and then once we're done, we're like, oh, yes. And by the way, I need to name the object something. But to do that, you need to reverse the assignment operator. So then you put the minus sign first and then the greater than sign. So then under the name of the object, right? So I've seen this done a lot when doing like essentially graphs, but maybe other people have experience doing this differently. And it's also when you're reading your code or someone else's uh, script, it's super clean to just focus on the on the ggplot, uh, or if you're doing dplyr or uh, just working with uh, the data frame or something like that, to just focus on that. And then the name is like sort of like, oh, yeah, by the way, this is called this, yeah. right? So we use the reverse assignment with that. Oh, God. John, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I I have never seen a good reason to do it, but you actually can do both directions because the first part returns 10. When, so when you do the assignment, it returns 10 invisibly. So then you could assign that thing to Y. Mm -hmm. Don't do that though. Uh, I have seen it the reverse. <laughs> I've seen arguments for like making it the standard or people who in their workflows make it the standard. And I can see it, you know, in... The case you have or in a pipe which we'll talk about you know later that if you have a series of piped expressions yeah. sometimes assigning at the end makes sense um it's interesting that you can i don't i almost never do it I, sometimes if i'm working in the console just playing around with something um just like you say like i'll work 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 and oh i should assign that to something and so uh being able to do that is nice but most of the time I use the, uh, whatever, the forward assignment or the, it's funny because the reverse assign is the forward arrow, the forward arrow is the sign. But, um, anyway, yeah. The downside of the reverse yeah, assign I think, is I think that. It, yes, Flores, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a downside of the reverse assign is that you cannot um, always easily notice which objects are created in scripts. Yeah. Because they are not anymore at the left side of the yeah. of the of the scripts. And well, at least I wouldn't mix them. Yeah. I would make sure you have a standard, which is part of what we're going to be talking about. And then like it would be nice. I don't know. I haven't worked with it if you could get these dot like highlight special or something in your editor so that you could find the things that are assigned. Um, but yeah, I, I always, almost always use forward assign. Yeah, and I think maybe it depends on, uh, um, sometimes I'm always weary, I hope that's the right word, when I see these things because my professor taught me like this, right? One of my professors, professors taught me like this and then I'm going to replicate that with my students so that's why groups like this one sort of helps you put things in perspective because for me then this was common practice turns out it maybe it's not so much so but it's always also good to see things like this because you 
sometimes, especially if you're a, like a data um, data analyst or something like that, you are going to see code done by other people and you have to sort of, in, uh, not interpret, well, yeah, in a way, interpret what other people are trying to code and trying to see. And then you're going to run into these things and you're going to be like, what is this, right? So it's always kind of interesting to see how other people are coding or other fields, how people are, are coding. Anyway, if anyone wants to add something else to this, then please, if not, then let's move on. There's this thing, the double assign that I've seen sometimes. I don't know what's up with this, but I I, so I thought of bringing it to, you know, to the I don't to see if someone has any thoughts think, about this double assign. I don't think we get into anything in this entire book where that makes sense. Uh, it assigns things like in the frame above where you're working, which doesn't even make sense for a long time. But if you read advanced R, they'll go into it then. Um, almost always, if you are using the double assign arrow, you are like breaking something. And if you know that you're doing it, it's okay. But if you find yourself using like, oh, I've got to do this, uh, probably there's an easier way to do something um, because it's it's like overriding. It's it's kind of the, the overriding assign. So inside of a function, you can assign things outside of the function using this. And it's almost never a good idea. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you see something like this, beware. Warning, warning. Okay. Exactly. The There's a package. Um, so then we can start talking about combining elements. Yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. There's a, a, a package called Memoize that in its help, it tells you to use this and it is correct. That is one of the very few cases. So if you're using that package and you, you know, if you're using a reputable package and they tell you to use double assign, okay, probably in that case, but don't, don't just decide to use it yourself. <laughs> oh, I see the yeah. comment now. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, and we perfect. So we'll get the the um, <laughs> the chat in the in the book too in the in this thing. Okay, let's move ahead or let's, let's go ahead and talk about combining elements. So when we are working with vectors or lists too, right? Or well, anything, anytime you want to just combine elements into a vector, then we use the C, and then inside we put all the elements. And that C stands for, I've heard it both ways, combine and concatenate. So it's just a way of aggregating things into um, into a, I don't want to say list, but into a, a C, right? And then assigning it to, a, uh, or being assigned it to, a, to, a, to an object. So basic arithmetic operations are going to be applied to every element of that vector. So like that example that I have here, if we have a yeah, a vector with the following numbers assigned to the object called primes, then if we do primes times two, then that times two is a, is, um, is an operation that's going to be applied to every element of that vector, right? So the resulting, if we save it or if we just put it in the console, uh, then the resulting thing is going to be every object multiplied by that. Combine values into a vector or list, but objects to be concatenated yeah so i guess see whichever way you see it right it's your combining elements or values concatenating <laughs> yeah okay then common so this is a big thing that we should discuss a lot but because i think a good script or a good um portal document markdown document whatever it is that you're working with a good document is commented, right? A good script should have comment. For you now, for future you, and for everyone else that may come across your script. So in R, to insert comments, we use the pound sign or the hashtag, whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, essentially, where you put them, that's another topic of, I think it's, well, based on, or not based, but um, 
it depends on the style of each person because I've seen them above what you're trying to code. Other people put them like below, other people put them like right um, next to the code. So instead of just doing primes, blah, 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 two, three, and then parentheses, then the comment starts here. I've seen it many ways. I think that's up to the preference of each person, right? But um, essentially comment your script. Why you should comment your script? Because like I said, it can save you, your future you and collaborators a lot of time and you can understand yourself essentially, right? What do we put in comments? I think that's the key thing here. And the book suggests that you don't have to do the how or the what, but the why you're doing something in your code. So for example, if, you are, if you're using a function that has an argument equal to 0.9, um, or you're changing a default value that let's say was the value of the default was one, and then you're changing it to 0.9, if you just put comment, changed default value to 0.9, then that's like not helping anyone, but it would help a lot if you put the why you did that. So I increased the smoothing parameter and then I would even go further and put in parentheses the name of the parameter yep. to better capture the trend in the data and then put the values or something like that. So open to discussion, please. I think- <laughs> So John says, start each line with, with hashtag, okay. Well, I, that was in response to the multi-line comments that there isn't, R doesn't have yeah. like an open and closed comment character like some languages do. Um, you can, each line that you want to do it on, you need to start with a, um, a hash. As far as the mix or the, you know, where to put it, I always before, in my opinion, uh, not, not after, just because it gets confusing if you do both. Um, or to the right, like you can, you know, put a comment somewhere in the middle of a line. If it's just some little thing, sometimes I'll do that, but usually I put my comments on a separate line. Um, and then it's kind of funny. There's um, kind of a whole school of thought around, like you should name things better and you should break things off into functions. And if you do that enough, you don't need comments because the name of the function tells you what the comment would have said, but that's still not always true. Like the example on the next page, um, why you did a thing still isn't captured in the comment. So I think really sticking to the why in comments um, and Yes, so, and uh, Flores pointed out that you can turn on um, in our studio that it'll continue the comment when you hit enter. And I do that, sometimes it's annoying, but uh, for the most part, like it's e easy enough to deal with it. So I do like that setting. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I like you should comment a lot until it feels like too much and then you'll learn to back off a little bit. Um, by naming things better. <laughs> yes, I think um, I think I haven't found anyone, but I, again, I you know I talk to scientists and that I'm, I'm an ecologist, so that's my field, that's my world. So in my field, at least, I haven't found anyone that says, "Oh no, less comments are better." So if you have to put in my field again, I'm not saying this is what John recommends or people are so or whatever, but if you have a paragraph of explanation, it's commented out, who's gonna hurt, right? So I'd rather have that than no comments at all. So so yeah, but that's... Um, I think it, it, it really depends. And, and it always, um, I, I think that the, the way to always, uh, finish this type of discussion is use your common sense. Because for example, if you have your function, you may put a header to the function explaining what the function, you a, a, a couple of sentences or a paragraph explaining what the <clears throat> function will be doing, maybe saying what parameter, parameters it will be receiving, what is returning. And then if at some specific part in the function, there is something in the code, that's a little hacky or something that you 
spend a little time on doing that specific part of the algorithm, you can put, put then a why and also a what, because maybe in that case, the what is important because it's something like quite strange that you are doing that. So those are the cases that, yeah, using your judgment. And yeah, I'm in the camp of um, there's not too much because in the worst case, if it's multiple line, I can hide the hide it in a in, in the in the development environment. So in the worst case, you will hide it. So personally, um, I would say comment and using your judgment. Yeah, and it's true what you said um, because sometimes the documentation for certain functions. It's not the best. And I've seen some packages that use literally like if the if the argument is called, let's say, distance, the description is distance. And you're like, how? Why? Right. So sometimes the comments go there. But anyway, moving on. Um, so moving on and talking about something else. Um let's talk about assigning names to objects, right? So names in our studio, um, on in R, I guess in general, names must start with a letter. They can contain, um, well, start with a letter, contain letters, obviously in the name. It can contain numbers, just not start with a number. And you can use um, underscript and periods in the middle. Good style convention means that it, your code is gonna be more readable for you, for your future you, and for any, anyone else that's going to read your code. So that's, again, let's go to the, and talk about the full thing situation, because I swear to you every time I see this tool in Stark Overflow examples, I'm like, why? Why? Why, right? My, um, my advisor in grad school, he used to, for every new data frame that he was creating, he would name them DF. So it makes sense, right? Because it's a data frame, but then you're like, data frame for what? Um, so 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 yeah, so assigning names. And sometimes some people are gonna have like a certain way of assigning names. Like I said, if it's a data frame, then your name is gonna end up in DF or something like that, right? So use descriptive names. Long names are okay as long as it's not like, you know, a chain of words that then who has time to write that again. The book recommends to use snake case in assigning names, and the and by that we mean this. So forgive me for the bad word that it's in the little picture here, but um, this is a very good example of what it means to use different uh, naming styles. So snake case means that you separate words uh, with the underscore. And everything is in, for the most part, from what I've seen, everything is in lowercase. The other one that you see a lot is the camel case, which is the first word is going to start with the lowercase. And then each preceding sort of separate word starts with a, a, what do you call it? Lowercase, higher case? No, it's greater case. The other case. Anyway. Um, um, I have to run but for yeah, a minute, so this but is, I will this is essentially what the book listening. recommends, but I think it's, okay. So, but that's the, what the book recommends, but I think this is really, this is really up to people's preference, right? And I re remember seeing someone talk about functions. Uh, you use camel case with functions and then snake case with um, naming like the, um, the columns in your data frame too. I've, I've heard people say that too. Um, but anyway, if someone wants to talk about that. Oh, and then there's a package to convert between cases though. So pretty cool, John, thanks for sharing that. Um, and then you were talking about the full, you were, let me see. So you said, noting this to discuss when we get to it. Programmers think they're funny by using full and bar as random example words from full bar, I don't know who they're think they're being funny, but anyway, as random example words from full bar, which is a military acronym for fed up beyond all recognition. There's a push to get people to stop using those because they confuse people for no good reason. So yeah, but then 
why are you using it in your example? I saw hair, I just don't get the joke. Because okay. someone started doing American, it in so the it. Um, but yeah. 60s or something. It's a, you're you're lagging a little bit or I am lagging a little bit, one of the two. So I apologize for delays in conversation. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, like it's it just became the standard thing to do down to the point that the third one is Baz. You do food, then bar, then Baz for no really good reason. I don't even, I don't know why it's Baz. Like other than it comes after bar, I don't know. Um, and yeah, there are, there are various pushes, especially in like in education to, hey, stop that because it makes people think it has some specific meaning because they keep seeing it all over the place in code. And it's like, no, it, it like it's meant to not mean anything that was what it was originally for, but it's like too ubiquitous. <laughs> and so instead, like a lot of times people will use, um, you know, simple things that people would know like fruits or um, that's a very common one actually is fruits um, or animals or pets or things like that where you use specific examples that make more sense. Um, but yeah, the, the short version of that is it doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just supposed to be a random word. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually, um, yeah, that's super interesting. And I think my advisor told me about this, but I forgot because I was like, I hate it anyway, so I'm not going to remember it. But then, yeah. Um, so then yeah. remember that R is case sensitive and it can't read your mind. So there's a whole thing about this. And yeah, if you're using using lowercase or if you're using uppercase, just remember that that is going to be uh, you have to keep using the same way, right? If it's everything lowercase, then it's gonna it's gonna matter. You cannot mix or yeah, you cannot mix them. And typos typos matter, right? So that's um just I cannot even tell you how many times I've been trying to do something and then there's a typo, like an H in the wrong place, and then you know trying to find it. Then it anyway. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. If not, we can move to functions. So, um, wait oh, yes. for a sec. <laughs> I just had to share, mm -hmm. you know, one of my, that is, I don't actually use it, um, but I don't know, maybe I should. It was written purely purely to uh, help you catch typos and deal with them. And so it has some common functions and then basically they just alias those common functions and tell you, hey, you misspelled length uh is one of the common ones and therefore you know obviously the name is oh. uh because you you typoed the particular word that it is joking about so um that exists if you find yourself like having that problem a lot where you type length or or you know l-e-n-g-h-t or things like that it does the combinations mm -hmm. of the different order where it's basically the same thing um and actually, the that group think our grants. Um, some of their um, some of the people from there are active on R4DS, so you might see them around. Um, yes, so it's probably also very handy if you are dyslexic um, that you don't know that you typed it wrong, and it'll it'll tell you, "Hey, did you mean this?" I think it I think it has different settings of the level of um, like how much it'll nag at you about it versus just okay that's close enough <laughs> but obviously if you're going to share your code be careful about that because unless the other person is also running this or if, you know you put it in your script um your typoed words will not work yes yes for sure and um yeah it's, it's sometimes it's just a comma sometimes it's just like an h in the wrong place there's always something, isn't it? But anyway, <laughs> um, so if we move to function, um, which is a completely different topic from what we were talking about. Um, so functions overall look like this in R. So it's gonna have a name and then a set of arguments in between. So functions are uh, functions and objects are always displayed in the environment tab in our studio. 
if you created the function, right, then it's going to be um, shown there. Um, and in my experience, honestly, and 100%, if the documentation was really well made and they, the authors put some thought into really describing what the function is, everything is there in the help, in the, in the documentations. So what I usually do, but I've seen people do different things, is I just, in the console, I just type this and then the function that I want, let's say it's keyboard uh, wider, just like that, right? And then I hit enter and then it's going to open up the documentation for that. And then you're going to see there all the possible arguments and um, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that I just discovered thanks to Mastodon, well, I mean Fosterton, but thanks to the beauty of Mastodon and I just, it's the... Everyone is talking about sky blue or blue sky or whatever that thing's called. I love faster than that. I will never leave. That's like my preferred social media now. Um, anyway, moving on. So what I've seen that I learned this in faster than is that you can also do sometimes, at least with ggplot, you can do, I think it's like, um, what is it, geom? Geom bar. If you put this and then hit enter in the console, then you're going to see the um, default value that are associated with all the arguments from for that function, at least with ggplot. I don't know if it works with other functions, but at least with that's, ggplot, I've tried it. And it's super cool because sometimes you forget, like, right? Yeah, that's specifically a ggplot thing. So ggplot has, you know, functions like, oops, I have a typo in there, but, you know, geom underscore bar. And if you do the capitalized version or the Pascal case version of that, uh, that tells you, um, information about the object. So that is useful to know. I, I had forgotten about that. And it tells you all the aesthetics that it uses. Um, yeah, the default aesthetics that they have, like for example, if the line width is one, set to one, that's the default. And then for some reason you forget about that and then you can sort of go from there. But it's, it's super handy, at least for that one. I wish other packages had that too. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so that's um, so that's that's the thing. But yeah, the documentation, if it's really thought out, like I said, the argument, everything is there. You just have to really read it. And I'm one of the people that I'm like going through this like very fast, and then I'm like, oh, what did it say? And then I rather ask someone. But no, if you really pay attention to documentation, the arguments are gonna be um, are gonna uh, it's key, right? So that you can understand what each one is. And the thing, the other thing is that these arguments are, oh, whoops, sorry about that. So the arguments, they have like an order. So you can skip writing argument equals, like the name of the argument. You can just put the values that you want in the order that it's, um, that the function was defined in. And that's going to be, and that's going to be okay. Even when you write your own functions, just as long as you follow that order, then you're going to be okay. Oh, wow, what's that? Oh, yes, exactly. Thank you, Flores. Yes, exactly. So then yeah. it gives you, like, for example, there, the aesthetic mapping. The yeah, but it's just to show color, that you need it says that nothing. You... The fill is gray 35. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you need to um, go down one level to the default aesthetics to, to see its contents because it does not print uh, right away if you, you use the top level objects. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I forget about the dollar sign. Yes, thank you. See, this is what happens when I go off script. I didn't put it in here because <laughs> I just remembered, I think, this morning and then I go off script and then I need to remember not to do that. See? Anyway, thank you, Flores. Yes, at least now we have it in the chat. Um, okay, so then... Yeah. So with arguments like this, right, the other thing that the book talks about is that when you... Um, you can use tab, like the keyboard, the, in your keyboard, you can use a uh, tab key to show possible completions of functions and arguments, and then you can use escape to sort of remove the pop-up um, menu that it that appears right there. You can usually skip argument names but can make code more readable if you use like the 
in the case of sequence, for example, from and to, those are the names of the arguments. So you can skip them, but it's sometimes a good idea to include them just so that your code is more readable. The order of the named arguments is important. No, order of named arguments isn't important if you name them. But if you don't name them, I guess it is. Um, okay, and then other RStudio features when you, and I saw I saw the perfect, but I'm going to put it in the Slack because I saw the perfect meme for this. But if you go to your console and then you hit the up arrow, then you, you can see like previous function, not previous functions, previous lines of code that you have run. And then you can probably find something that you already wrote, right? But sometimes it's something so simple that you wrote that just going up with the arrow like 10 times takes you more time than just rewrite the code, right? So buy everywhere. Uh, and then you can do control command uh, up arrow to search history. And then another useful shortcut is to use alt or option shift k to see lots of shortcuts and that's like for me that's my favorite thing to know yeah, shortcuts in r studio because i hate using the mouse i'm gonna show you i don't know if you can see can you see this thing that i have here i don't know if you can see no maybe not i need to share again um No, yes, you can screen one. Okay, let's do screen one. So I have this, I created this little RStudio shortcuts that are my most used shortcuts. So anybody can use that, right? And I have it, I printed it and I have it here in my office. Um, but I also made it like a sticker and I have it in my uh, on my laptop because it's always, those are like my most used shortcuts. Like for example, if I wanna go from the, um, from the script to the console and not use the mouse, I use, Control one or control two, so you can find all of those shortcuts very easily if you do um, Alt Shift K, if I remember correct. Okay. And then that's it. That's it. We move to the exercises, and I don't know if anybody had any difficulty with the exercises. They were very, very simple but I solve them here. If anybody's interested, it's gonna be there in the presentation. And that's it, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. Yeah, all the reactor function is very low, separated battery. And also the VFA concentration is decreased. I don't remember if there was anything in the exercises that stood out. Um, let me pull them up real quick. We can go through each one of them if you like, but um, they were very straightforward. I you, think you just- want, uh, Do you want to do that, John, or- If you could we? just scroll down, uh, or yeah. I can pull it up, but um, I can't remember. It was essentially like typos. Yeah. With some arguments and functions. Oh, then talking about the shortcuts. With the order. Yeah. 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 Nope. There yeah. was nothing. You're, I agree. These were pretty straightforward. I think uh, just one thing that uh, that I liked to be reminded of is that um, the GG save, if I wonder why I'm not seeing my plot in my folder, it's because I probably put it in the wrong place and it's only saving the last one. So that's a good reminder. <laughs> you know, GGSAVE is one of those functions where I do use the arguments. I usually don't. I just write in the um, whatever part is for that argument, the value. But with ggsafe, for some reason, it always gives me an error. So I, I messed something up. So with ggsafe, I always okay. I always do a, a, something about ggsafe. And that's it then. John, I don't know if you want to add something or if we do stop or anybody wants to add anything else? I don't have anything else. Oh. 
right. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, interference from whoever else is. I think that's uh, on you, Gabby, that there's noise um, that we could hear. I don't know, someone I could hear. Yes. Uh, and I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Just letting you know. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else. Uh, that was a good, you know, pretty straightforward chapter. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about next week is getting into uh, much a much more meaty chapter um, where we're really getting into uh, the tidy verse. And so, yeah. All right. Um, same time next week. I'll see everyone then. See you. <laughs> see you. Bye. Thanks, Gabby. Bye.